evening, everyone. I invite you all to please stand and join us in our opening hymn. Our opening hymn is the summons, which can be found on page 178 in the Burgundy Celebrated Song Hymnal, page 178 in the Burgundy Hymnal. and sisters in Christ. Good evening. Great joy to be with you once again for the continuation of this mission we're titling Called. A reminder, we're all called by God in our various vocations and ultimately called to holiness, to be a saint. Now, quick show of hands, how many were here last night for the first mission? Okay, great. Okay. Now, how many of you, is it your first night being here at the mission? Hey, excellent, welcome. Uh, the mission is being live streamed as well, so we welcome our live stream audience who's watching as well from home. And it is available on the uh, Chatham Catholic website as well. So just a quick recap. Last night we reflected on Abraham's call from God to be not only the one who possesses the promised land, but to have a dynasty and rule it. Tonight we're going to see the result of that dynasty and reflect on David's call. He's also referred to often as King David. And David's name is interesting. It's a Hebrew word meaning beloved. But to begin, we have to look at David's call from God and learn from his story some of the traps we're called to avoid and how we can still be faithful to his, our call even if we fail at times. So the story begins, Samuel the prophet is again called to anoint the future king. And given the character of the current reigning king, Saul, he obeys with prudent caution. God sends Samuel to Bethlehem in the house of Jesse, of the tribe of Judah. Samuel assumes that God has chosen Eliab, Jesse's eldest son because of his height and stature. However, God rejects Eliab, just as he rejected Saul as king of Israel. 
This is a common thing we see with God's plan for our vocation. For the Lord sees not as we see. We look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks to the heart. That's why sometimes the most unlikely candidates are called to a particular vocation. We would never have imagined it. Certain men called to priests, really that guy? Certain people called to religious life, really that man, that woman? Certain people called to marriage, really? They're called to be married? But God sees what we don't see. Anyways, after the seven sons of Jesse are rejected one by one, Jesse's youngest son, David, is called from the field where he is shepherding the flock. Immediately, God reveals to Samuel that this is the chosen one to shepherd God's people. Samuel anoints David, and the Spirit of the Lord falls mightily on him. David will be the future king, but not without early challenges. We have the famed encounter of David and Goliath. Day and night, the mighty Goliath taunted and terrorized the heart of Saul and all of Israel. And what will David's response be? Saul's response, and the men of Saul, is cowardice. Even Saul is taller than all the other people. But David steps into the arena. What I find fascinating is that even though David has great courage, he is discouraged by Saul, who thinks, David is too young and inexperienced to fight the great warrior. David simply argues that just as he rescued his flock from predators such as lions and bears, so now he can rescue Israel with the power of God. Again, a common theme in both Abraham and David's story is the question, do you trust God? All of scripture can be summed up in that one question. All our lives of faith can be summed up in that one question. Do you trust God? Saul gives in and brings David to face Goliath. But before he does, Saul prepares David. And let's see what he does. This is found in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38 to 40. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I am not used to them. And David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd bag or wallet. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. By putting on the king's armor, which David tries on, he finds it too oversized and heavy. But with the unsophisticated weapon of the shepherd, a slingshot and five smooth stones, he goes out to battle. And of course, we know how the story ends. He nails Goliath in the head, killing him and saving Israel. 
I think it's an important lesson about any of our vocations or calling from God. Like Saul, at times we can feel we have to change who we are, how God made us to fit our particular vocation or calling. We have to act more like this saint or that saint. What David shows is that we have to be how God created us. How we are made. And then and only then can we be victorious in our daily challenges. Only with God's help. Because the theme is clear. With God, nothing is impossible. David's victory brings a new challenge, challenger, however. Saul, his trusted king and friend. Out of jealousy, Saul goes on a mission to kill David, leading David to flee for his life. David, at one point, has the upper hand and had two opportunities to kill Saul, but he refuses to do so, trusting in the Lord and seeking and seeing Saul as the Lord's anointed. Eventually, Saul dies, making David the new king of Israel. And David gets to work. Once he's appointed king at Hebron, by the leaders of the tribes, he captures Jerusalem and moves the Ark of the Covenant, the dwelling place of God, into Jerusalem, establishing it to be the center of the Jewish faith. In the eyes of the Lord, David was a good and faithful servant. But a problem would arise. Let's listen. This comes from Samuel 2. <coughs> Chapter 11, verse 1 to 5. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rahab. But David remained in Jerus at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking upon the roof of the king's house and he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her and he came to her, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am with child. So what happened? We can break it down into two failures. And both are warnings for us as we live out our calling. First, it mentions that the spring was when the kings were meant to go into battle. And where's David? He's sleeping in. He got comfortable with the perks of being king. And because of this, he has the near occasion of sin by seeing young Bathsheba naked. Now, this morning at Mass, I preached, and I preached about forgiveness, but I explained the definition of sin according to the Greek translation. Sin literally means to miss the mark. So if you were an archer and you're drawing your bow and arrow, and you missed the bullseye, you would say you sinned. Now, it doesn't sound like a big deal, right, Father? Miss the mark. Okay. Well, if the mark is heaven, I don't want to miss. And what David experiences in this moment of this near occasion of sin is a prime example of sloth or acedia. 
Sometimes we think of sloth as laziness. But I prefer Father Mike Schmidt from Ascension Presents definition. Sloth is not living out our vocation or calling authentically and failing to perform our daily duties or tasks. So, for example, if I had to prepare a homily for the weekend, but my kitchen dishes were in the sink, the slothful thing to do would be to wash the dishes and rush my homily or just go off the cuff. The reason why is my responsibility and duty is to proclaim God's word. And people expect it better out of us priests to be able to share the wisdom and insights that God has given us. So washing dishes are important, but it's not the immediate task or duty that I need to do. That would be an example of sloth. We also see that sin leads to more sin, and that's the nature of sin. Small sins roll up into bigger sins. And sadly, if we aren't too careful, we can not only lose our sense of purpose behind following God's will, but also lose trust and faith in Him. It truly is a slippery slope. The irony is David's craftiness. He comes up with a plan that fails horribly. David attempts a quick cover-up by calling Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to come home from the battlefield, expecting Uriah to sleep with his wife and then thinking that he is the father of her child. The plan backfires because Uriah refrains from the marital embrace for the sake of purity and solidarity with his fellow soldiers even after David tried to get him drunk before he came home. Trapped with his conundrum, David comes up with one last devious plan. He arranges for the death, or should we say murder, of Uriah on the battlefield. David sends orders to Joab, the commander of his army, to put Uriah at the front lines, basically assuring his death. Another irony, the message that was sent about Uriah's death, to put him at the front lines, was given to Uriah in a letter that David told him not to open and to give it to Joab. At the same time, David trusted that Joab would follow his orders and cooperate in the murder of Uriah because David knew Joab's behavior in the murder of an opposer of David named Abner. David, even in the depths of his sin, is a mastermind and a shrewd judge of character. He exploits both Uriah's faithfulness to follow orders and Joab's attitude for the benefit of his own preservation. Do you see the pattern that sin can take? How one sin can lead to a greater, like a snowball rolling down a mountain? David goes from sloth to lust to adultery to trying to lead a man, Uriah, to sin to deceit, to eventually murder. With Uriah out of the way, David now takes Bathsheba as his wife, and while he escapes public judgment, he did not escape the eyes of God. God sends his prophet Nathan, remember Nathan, he's the one who anointed David, to unmask David's sin by using a parable. Nathan tells him the story of a rich man who had many flocks and herds. This rich man robbed his poor neighbor of a single lamb 
who he cherished like a daughter. Nathan asked, what should happen to the rich man? David, fired up, expresses his unambiguous verdict of punishment. He should be punished. And then Nathan gives David the punchline. You are that man. You are that man. I think in our own lives, when we stray from God's plan or call for our lives, we all need a Nathan to call us back to God, to invite us to repent and turn back to him. We need individuals to lead us to grow in holiness. Sometimes it could be a friend, a family member, someone in our church community. And oftentimes when we share the truth with someone that we love, it's not always easy. Just like for Nathan, it wasn't easy for him to share with David that you are the man. But David needed to hear that. And sometimes we need to hear our own sinfulness in order to turn back to the Lord and to grow in our call of sainthood. David immediately realizes what he has done and repents. Even though David sins, even very seriously, he's still a man after God's own heart. Just as we sometimes fail in our Catholic Christian vocation or calling, as long as our hearts are in the right place, good and holy confession can help to lead us back onto the right path. But just because David repents doesn't mean there's no consequences. For David's sins, just like our own, there are consequences. The Lord forgives David, but the child of the affair will die. Despite David's efforts to pray and fast for his son's survival, the child dies. David learns about the consequences of sin. And Bathsheba eventually gives birth to another son, Solomon, who will take center stage after his father's death. But that's not the end of David's plight, oh no. According to the book of Wisdom, chapter 11, verse 16, one is punished by the very things by which they sin. This is definitely David's experience especially with the subsequent events of David and his son. His firstborn, Amnon, lusts after his half-sister, Tamar. She was sort of his Bathsheba. And Amnon, like his father, has a clever plan. He pretends to be ill in order to lure Tamar to come to his home so she can take care of him. When Tamar arrives in Amon's home, he violates her. David takes no action in punishing Amnon for his sin, and his failure to punish the wrongdoings trigger a new cycle of aggression. Absalom is Tamar's brother and presses David into sending Amnon to a feast where Absalom then kills Amnon. You could really see it becoming a real Game of Thrones situation in David's life. Just as David sent Uriah to his death in sending Amnon to the feast, he plays a similar role of judge, jury, and executioner. And once again, the pattern is repeated with Amnon's death. David does nothing. He doesn't punish Absalom. And because of this flaw in the leniency, Absalom realizes the throne is ripe for the picking. Absalom sets himself up as judge and wins favor with the people, amassing great support. And David, because of his passivity, 
isn't aware that a powder keg is brewing. After four years of making favorable decisions, Absalom strikes while the iron is hot and proclaims himself king of Hebron and mounts rebellion against David. David, just like in the days of Saul, once again has to flee for his life and safety. He heads east beyond the Jordan, that is beyond the boundary of the Promised Land. Like Adam and Eve, David's sin costs him the Promised Land and casts him into exile. It's a good lesson for us. Our sinfulness will often lead us to go into exile because God often sends us physically where we are already spiritually. If we find that God's plan is not working for our life, we have to take a good look at our own hearts and see if there are particular sins, serious or less serious, that's not allowing God's grace to penetrate into our lives. Eventually, David's army fights back and kills Absalom. But his death is not celebrated by David, but mourned. David has lost a son. And again, David's failures come back to haunt him. He hasn't, had he administered proper justice to Joab for the murder of Abner way back in the day, Remember, Joab is the one that led to the death of Uriah. He would not have lost his son to this violence. We reap what we sow. We as Catholics don't believe in karma, but we do believe in the consequences of our actions. The last wave of chaos for David's life comes when Adonijah, David's fourth son. With the reign of David ending, and Adonijah realizing that David is going to pass the torch to Solomon, Adonijah raises support like Absalom and decides to usurp the throne by having his own coronation and claiming himself king. The news only reaches David's ears from Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba. What is David to do? In response, David summons Zadok the priest, Nathan and Bathsheba with specific instructions to anoint and declare Solomon king. David acts. The plan works as Adonijah flees while his guests at his private coronation scatter. As he lays dying, David gives Solomon some wise advice. Knowing that the kingdom does not depend on military might or political strategy, but on a king's fidelity to God, David leaves these last words with Solomon. And this comes from 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. When David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man and keep charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies. As it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed of their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail you a man on the throne of Israel.
David, at the end of the day, was not a perfect king. He didn't follow God's will perfectly. But who of us can say the same? I can't say I always follow God's will, but I try to make up for where I fail in my sin through prayer, sacrifice, penance, fasting, and most importantly, making a good confession. If we want to grow in the knowledge and wisdom like that of King David, we will find the right place in the sacrament of confession where we hear God's mercy abundantly. And I want to share with you that because that's a part of my story, God's mercy. So to recap those who weren't here last night, the story was on my vocation, how I became a priest. So I shared with the people that were here last night that I went to high school, studied to be a crown attorney, to be a lawyer eventually, left, went to university, received a call from my old high school chaplain or campus minister, went to mass at my old high school, was invited to go to a come and see weekend, which is a weekend retreat to think about the priesthood. And it was Saturday night and I was in the chapel and I was experiencing holy hour adoration for the first time. As I was sitting there in this dark chapel, my only thought in my mind is one hour with nothing to do, nothing to read, in silence. You really know how to pick your Saturday nights, don't you, Danny? That's what I thought right away. But the Lord did something special for me that evening. Because as the vocations director came up to the ambo to share a fervorino or a little short homily, he said this to us. He said, gentlemen, the priesthood might not be for everyone, but if God is calling you, do not be afraid. You may feel unworthy. You may feel you're not called. You may feel you're a terrible sinner. Don't allow that to block the grace of God and his mercy. God doesn't ready the equip. He equips the ready. So in my mind, for the first time, I I had a conversation with God. Now, people often ask me, how do I know God is speaking to me? Like, is it a booming voice? This is God, Danny. I'm like, no, I I don't think so. Maybe some people, but not, not everyone. I think a majority of us, the voice of God is that sort of inner voice, that intuitional voice. It's a voice of clarity and reason. And the voice shared this with me. He says, did you hear what that priest said? That's a lot to think about, Danny. And I said, yeah, I know, I know, but the priesthood's not for me. He's like, why not? What are you worried about? I said, well, you know, it's, 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 no, no, what are you worried about? (sighs) I'm a sinner. I don't go to Mass on Sunday. I barely know what the catechism is. I don't pray. I don't read scripture. Like, there's no way I'm called to be a priest. Zero. Absolutely zero. Didn't you listen to what Father said? God doesn't ready to equip. He equips the ready. If you're called to be a priest, don't you believe that I would give you everything you need to be a good and holy priest? And I just went, yeah, I guess so. All the gifts that I thought would help me to be a great lawyer, my public speaking, my enjoyment of, of the law, my sense of duty and responsibility. It could work as a priest, sure. But as the hour progressed, I experienced for the first time ever benediction. Now, benediction is when the priest or deacon takes the monstrance, and the monstrance comes from the Latin word meaning to demonstrate or to show, and it's showing us Jesus. Same Jesus in the tabernacle, the same Jesus we receive at Holy Mass is placed in the monstrance. And the priest blesses us, or the deacon blesses us with Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the face of Jesus. And as I received that blessing for the first time, I found a sense of peace and tranquility. It's as if time stood still. I just wanted to be with the Lord. I wanted my heart to be undivided. I wanted to give it all to Jesus. And I realized everything I thought would make me happy, everything I thought that would give me joy, 
everything that I thought would give me peace was just fading away. And all that remained was Jesus. That Sunday, I experienced Mass in the seminary, and it was one of the best Masses in my life. And I think the reason why is because for the first time ever, I was there with a desire to want to be there. And I was hungering for the Eucharist. I wanted to be closer to Jesus. As the retreat ended, my parents came and picked me up because I didn't have a vehicle at the time. And I looked at my mom and I looked at my dad and I said, Mom, Dad, I think I want to be a priest. My dad, being from the uh, mainland of Portugal, he said, all right, this is great. Your family will love it. You know, this is awesome. We'll have to tell Grandpa and Grandma. They'll, they'll love you. My mom, she gave me the silent treatment for three days. Oh, you want to be a priest. Now, I think parents have a hesitation for their sons when they think about priesthood because the fear is, you know, they're not going to be happy. You know, they're giving away their gifts and their intelligence and their talents to the church. And, you know, it's just, it's not a life for you. But I think parents and my mom, what she wanted to see is, she wanted to see me happy. And she was afraid that the priesthood was not going to be a place where I'd be happy. But I told her, Mom, it's not, it's not going to be right away. I, I need time to think about this. I need time to what's called discern. So I started that. I remember the first morning I woke up, made the sign of the cross as I got out of bed and said, okay, new day. Here we go. And everything changed. I got more involved in my faith. I was going to church on Sunday. I was starting to read at Mass. I was an altar server once, trial by fire. I was 22 years old and... Uh, Father tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're serving today. I'm like, I don't know how to serve. Don't worry. Trial by fire. You'll figure it out. Baptism by fire. I was going to retreats. I was going to events. I was talking with my vocations director in Toronto. I was doing all the things that I thought were getting me ready. And I had my plan in mind. I had my plan all organized. I said, okay, my plan is this. I'm going to study philosophy at the university because I had to have it anyways, but to be a priest or seminarian, you first have to have philosophy. So I said, I have to study philosophy. So I changed, uh, I made sure I had my major in philosophy and I had took all the courses that were required by the seminary in order to avoid having to do philosophy before I entered. And I continued on with religious studies and political science as I did. After six years, I finally said, okay, I think I'm called to the priesthood. I know, I'm my, I know my age, I know I'm mature, I'm ready to do this. I talked to the vocations director, and I said, okay, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. Okay, awesome, awesome. So, I met with the vocations director, he gave me the application, I filled out the application, I went for the interview, and the interview was, it was okay. I guess it would, I'd describe it as okay. It wasn't the, my best interview, but it wasn't my worst. And then all of a sudden, I got a letter from the seminary, St. Augustine's seminary. It said, Dear Mr. Danny Santos, thank you for your application. At this time, we don't feel your call to be a priest. Please consider our prayers as we are praying for you. Signed, the team and rector of St. Augustine's. My heart just sank. My heart just sank. It became as if God basically took a knife and just stabbed it in my heart. Because I felt I was faithful. I felt I was doing everything right. I felt I was doing everything according to God's plan. And this is what you do to me? Lord, why? Why? I entered a bit of a, a depressive funk. I still went to church, but I went to church very sad and hurt. And my thought was, priesthood is not for me. It's done. I'm finished. So I started reflecting on what do I want to do now? Well, I said I either want to be a teacher or I want to be a chaplain. One or the other. I said, okay. So 
I talked to my career counselor at the, at the university. He said, okay, this is the course that we recommend you take this year to prepare for either of those fields. And we also recommend you talk to someone who is in that, a program that you're interested in. So I knew I could talk to my campus minister, Ms. DeVideo, from my old high school. I had a good connection with her. But deep down, I don't think I was not feeling the call, but I think it was a place of pain and darkness and uncertainty. I think when we come to that place of uncertainty, God's will is much harder to find. It's like, it's like a fog. You just can't see it. You just can't see it. And I think prayer is a lot like that too. When we pray, when we ask the Lord to do His will in our lives, and the answer is no, it gets us angry and disheartened. What kind of good father is this? Why would God do this to us? But I remind people, prayer is answered in one of three ways. Yes, no, what you're asking for is not part of my will, or no, I have something greater in mind for you. Something that you don't even know. The third one's the hardest, I'll be honest. The third one is the hardest. So, I had my mind made up. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a chaplain. And I went to visit my campus minister, Mr. Video. And I brought up what was going on in my life. And I said, in the most pathetic, sad, abysmal voice, I said, well, Ms. DeVideo, I think I want to be a, a chaplain or a teacher, I guess. She says, no, you don't. No, you don't. I, said, well, I felt like saying, excuse me, who are you to tell me no? And she asked me a good and profound question, a question I ask everyone when they're thinking about their vocation. What is your heart telling you? What is your heart telling you? I think that's what led David to turn back to the Lord. He asked himself, what is my heart speaking of? And I think it's a good question we can ask ourselves when we're lost in that fog. What is my deepest desire? They say that the longest journey in our faith is from the mind to the heart. It's a long journey, trust me, it's a, it's a, it's a lifelong journey. It's easy to have all these ideas of God and love and mercy and action and communion and community, but to have it in the heart, a part of who our affect is, our, not only just our feelings, but our very self, that takes time. That takes time. Usually one of my answers to a lot of times when seminarians or when men or women are struggling in their vocation says, you're thinking of this as a head decision, this is a heart decision. Take that to prayer. And my response to her when I said, well, what is my heart telling me? It's like, I, I don't know what my heart is telling me. What, what, what do you want me to say? But all I could do is I could start to weep. I started to cry. And I just said, I think I would just, I, it was just all the frustration coming out, all the anger, all the pain, all the confusion, finally coming out in this one emotion, just saying, I, I, I don't know what, what the Lord wants. I, I don't know what I want anymore. I thought I wanted to be a priest, but I guess I don't, because they said I can't be a priest. She said, breathe. Look, Danny, right now, you're in the Garden of Gethsemane. With Jesus, suffering, asking the Father to do his will. And you're not even on the way to Calvary yet. You have to be crucified. You have to die to yourself, to your will, to what you want, in order for God to do something for you. Because without the crucifixion, there can't be a resurrection. The resurrection can't exist without the crucifixion. They both go hand in hand. For a long time, Danny, you've been driving this vehicle you call your life. Let go. Let God take the wheel. It's more enjoyable being the passenger after all. But I know you're disheartened. I know you're saddened. I'm going to recommend something. I have a friend who works at a Catholic bookstore. 
And I think she would be a great asset for you. She would really help you to open your mind and heart to whatever God is calling you to, whether it's being a chaplain, a teacher, or even a priest. And I said, thanks. I needed to hear that. When I think of my vocation story, a lot of times I think of you know, the people in my life that helped me to un- discover who I am as a man. And when I think of the prophet Nathan, as we heard in today's reading, uh, today's reflection, I think Miss DeVito was my Nathan. She called me on what I wanted. And what did I want? What did I want? I didn't know. I didn't know what I wanted. I thought I knew what I wanted, but I didn't. I knew I wanted it my way, in my fashion, in my, in my ability to do what I want, how I want, when I want, right? That's the culture today. Do what you want and you'll be happy. But ultimately, it's do what God wants for us. And that's where we find true happiness, even though it's not easy sometimes. So I met my, uh, uh, this woman who works for this Catholic bookstore. Her name was Suki. And when I went to work there, I told her that, you know, I'm just here to help out a little bit. She says, oh, that's wonderful, wonderful, that's great. Um, so I did some inventorying of the catalog. I put it all together. I got it all organized. And one day, she came up to me. And she said, Danny, you're such a young, happy, holy, handsome man. No, I had the handsome part. I'm just like, <laughs> so you're awake. <laughs> Why don't you become a priest? And I'm like, oh. I can't be a priest. That doesn't work for me. I wasn't accepted at the seminary. I called them. They said, no. Like, what do you want me to do? She said, said Danny, there's other seminaries and other dioceses. Like, you know, you ever heard of St. Peter's Seminary in London? I'm like, London, England? No, London, Ontario. I'm like, there's a London, Ontario? <laughs> when I got here to, to the Diocese of London, I'm like, Oh, that's where Windsor is. I, I didn't even know Windsor existed. So, fortunately, Toronto boys, we, we believe Ontario ends in Hamilton. So, and I said, wow, I got really excited. Like, there's another seminary? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. She said, but before you even think about applying, you need to promise me three things. One, you need to promise me you're going to go back to Mass. And daily if you can, because the Mass is where you receive the Word of God and receive his Eucharist. Two, you've got to go to confession because the evil one's going to try to set up stumbling blocks and traps. Don't let him trap you. Go to confession regularly if you can, at least once a month. And three, adoration. If adoration's where you discover your vocation, adoration is where you'll rediscover your vocation. Do those three things, and I promise you, God will speak to your heart. I said, thanks, Suki. Next week, I contacted her and said, like, do you want me to come back? She says, no, you're fired. Off you go. (laughs) I did what I could. And then something miraculous happened. But to find out, you're going to have to come back tomorrow. Yeah, so stay tuned. So tomorrow night, uh, 7 p.m., here we'll have the conclusion. We're going to reflect on Queen Esther. And uh, you'll hear the end of my vocation story. And tonight as well, we have reception downstairs, so please join us downstairs for the reception. Um, And we will conclude in singing our closing hymn. So please stand.
So teach my son.